Hello and welcome to episode 31 of The Best Games, period. I'm your host, Jack Gardner, and with me as always are the lovely Daniel Jones and the trusty Jeremy Brown. And uh, this week we are going to be talking about and discussing the iconic first-person shooter of the mid-2000s, Bioshock. We're going to be talking about whether we think it's one of the best games, period. That's what we do on this show. We discuss. Sure do. But before we get into all that, how are you guys doing? How are you doing, Daniel? I'm tired. I don't know if you can tell. (laughs) I apologize to the audience right away. I'm just tired. My daughter's two and a half years old, going on like six, and she (laughs) just wears me out. It was a long Fourth of July weekend. Yeah, that's true. Because it was three days and two days every weekend with her is enough to <laughs> wear me out. So three days is exhausting. I don't know how the daycare people do it. Her plus eight other kids all at the same time <laughs> with all the same amount of energy. That's well, it's because they don't you, ha- you have to handle the night care. Yeah, they don't. That's they don't have to deal with that. Tired and. Yeah. But, so but, is she in the middle of her terrible twos, or are the twos not really that that terrible? She has her moments where she's pretty terrible, but <laughs> like, she's let it be known very that this is funny. the this is the episode where Daniel Jones trashes his daughter. <laughs> she no, but she has her moments where she's actually really funny though. Like yeah. tonight, I don't know what she was doing. Oh, but she. She was, oh, she was telling the cat to rub up on her leg. She was naked because she was getting into the bath. She was, she was supposed to be getting in the bath. And she, <laughs> she came out to the kitchen to show mommy that she was naked. Uh-huh. And she saw Desi, the cat, and she's like, Desi, Desi, my leg, Desi, my leg. And, uh, the cat. She just <laughs> she wanted him to rub up on his leg on her leg, but he wanted nothing to do with her. <laughs> he can't. Plus, cats stand her. cats don't do that. <laughs> cats cats don't respond to commands. No, they do not. <laughs> she doesn't know that yet. Yeah, but she's she's doing all right. But she's very smart. The other day, this is how smart she is. All right, all right. Mm-hmm. We were I was cooking her eggs, and um, I she wanted to watch me cook them. So she helped me crack the eggs, and we stirred them, and, and you know we scrambled them. Yeah. And um, then I put a little butter in the pan, and I said, "It's hot. Don't touch it." You know, and 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 like a few minutes later, I said, "All right, so the the butter's gonna be melting now, and see, it's melted." And I said, "How? What made it melt?" And she goes, "It's hot." I was like, yeah, oh my god, you're right. <laughs> like, I did not expect her to say that to answer that question correctly. It was just kind of a rhetorical, but she was right. <laughs> well, good good job Very teaching your daughter Papa. heat. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like science, chemistry. What's new with you guys? Yeah, what what about Jeremy? Not much. Working, moving, same as last week and the week before. You're moving and shaking. Moving. Shaking and moving. Something like that. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're all a little bit tired this week. But we're gonna we're gonna try and pull that energy from our depths of our hearts and uh really give you something something to take home with you to the missus or the mister, as the case might be. Or or the <laughs> no one if you live alone. I don't know why I'm saying things. Jeremy, you're moving, though. Uh, did you move completely? No, no, still working on getting Jen's stuff out of her house. Finally got most of her other house finished, I guess, which really didn't need any work okay. to begin with. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, okay. Anyway... What about you, Jack? What's new with you? Oh, that's right. I I didn't say anything about myself. No, you didn't talk about yourself. Um, not a whole lot's new with me. I uh, I've started running more. Oh, 
like you, you know how like everyone always says that they've started running um, yeah and uh yeah every time i go out for a run it's a reminder of how much running is just the worst it really is it, i don't un- i I say I don't understand how people do it, but I I get it because I used to be one of those people. Yeah. Now it's just body. Why? (laughs) Yeah. So I'm doing that. Uh, I finished the Banner Saga 2, which uh, I want to like that series a lot. And I really liked the first one. Second one is all kind of across. It's all over the place and it feels very rushed. Which was kind of sad because I was really looking forward to it. Are you playing on Xbox One or? Uh, I played it on PC. Could have gotten it free on Xbox. I One. I know. Or... I was kicking myself because, like, I, I bought it actually like a couple months ago, and I just now uh, got around to playing it. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I finished, I saw that it was free on Xbox One, and I was just kind of like, "Dang it! I missed it. <laughs> missed my chance." That's funny. So. That's kind of that's kind of what I got going on. Um, okay, things are good. Although, I also learned over the course of this last week that I don't i I thought I did, but I don't own a copy of Bioshock, which was quite frankly shocking, because I we, like we we talked about it on our old podcast. I, this is the second week in a row where we're covering a game that we talked about a couple years ago. <laughs> Extensively. On our old podcast. Yeah. And uh, we argued about that game for hours. Literal hours. And, yeah. Uh, like, the podcast in which we talked about Bioshock was three hours long. We had to cut it up into three different parts. Um, and I don't own it, which is the craziest <laughs> thing. I, I, When I first played it, I borrowed it from a friend of mine. And I guess I just never bought another copy after that, which is crazy. And which means I haven't, I hadn't played the game since, uh, 2007, which those of you who are good with numbers might recognize as nine years ago. Wait, you haven't played it since then? I've I've played I've played bits and pieces of it oh. at like other people's places. I went back and revisited the demo, and like I watched a playthrough for it when Bioshock Infinite came out. Yeah, but I haven't actually sat down and played through it uh, since it came out. Oh man! Yeah, I mean, I guess I've only played through it maybe one other time since then, but yeah. It's kind of one of those games that, like, I revisit often, but I don't really play through all the way. Like, I'll play, like, halfway through. I'll play till, um, maybe till, um, the, the, the park, whatever, the, like, Central Park equivalent area, whatever that's called. I can't even remember what it's called. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll I'll stop. I, I I've done that probably a few times in in the past few years. Just to, I I just really love the atmosphere, and every once in a while I just want to pop it in, and play it again. Now I haven't played Bioshock Two. Does that have a really good opening? I think the last time I played Bioshock all the way through was right before Bioshock Two, and I'm one of the people that really enjoyed Bioshock Two. So. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it has a good opening. I think it's got a good story. I actually read the Bioshock book as well, so I'm kind of a oh, fan. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Is it? Yeah, I read that too. Does it, what? Okay. Does it follow? Yeah. Does it follow <laughs> the the same plot, or is it about something completely different? No, it's about the founding of Rapture. Yeah, really. Yeah, like the original plumber. <laughs> that, yeah. That, no, seriously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's really what it's about. It's about. It's a really dark Mario. <laughs> yes. It's about building. The city. Yeah. This <laughs> okay. essentially this this plumber got called to fix Andrew Ryan's toilet in his big mansion and he did a good job and was discreet and whatnot and uh so Andrew Ryan recruited him to help build Rapture. It, it's it has, and it, and it has a pretty sad ending as well. It's yeah, it's it's a good it book. Actually, it sounds like a pretty good premise, but it, the immediate thing that my brain leaps to is 
I don't think a plumber would be a really good architect for an underwater city. That seems like you'd want... Well, I'm not sure he was in charge of all the, you know... Right, but, right. But, yeah, you know, fixing the leaks. Yeah. And I think, see, when you play all the games and then read the literature, sometimes they kind of blend together and you kind of forget which comes from which. But I think they were actual characters in the second Bioshock. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was asking about the intro because for me, the opening of the original Bioshock, like the first 10 minutes mm-hmm. of that are incredible. They are. Like The opening to, turn- to does not compare, but it's not bad. Okay. Because uh, to me, like... The intro to Bioshock is perfect, and also the intro to Bioshock Infinite is perfect. Like, I think both of those things do different things with their openings, but they're both perfect for the games that they are setting up. Uh, Yeah, I I would agree. The opening to Infinite is just jaw-dropping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I think when this game came out in 2007... Like I, it's it. I played I played through it for this podcast. I was got got my hands on a copy of Bioshock, and I played through not the entire game, but you know the first maybe hour and a half or so, two hours of it, just to kind of refresh my memory. And the opening ten minutes of Bioshock are incredible and like going back to originally playing it like the water effects were insane for the time like i think there are some people who probably for the next eight years probably held that up as like the standard of water in games um and like the fire as the plane is kind of crumbling and sinking into the ocean uh, and then you walk into the lighthouse, and you see all the lights. The door closes behind you. All the lights are dark, and then lights start coming on, uh, illuminating. You know, no, no gods, no kings, only men, only man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Like that's uh, like that. And then you step into the bathosphere, and Andrew Ryan starts talking, giving you his spiel, kind of selling you on Rapture, and like the ideal of it. And then you get down there and you see that, Oh, this dream that he was just selling you is totally and completely screwed. Yeah. Um, and like that, that whole sequence is in a nutshell is what Bioshock is all about. Um, you kind of get that in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, you definitely do. Yeah. You spend most of the rest of the time figuring out what went wrong through, you know, various different means, such as the audio, audio yeah, tapes I mean, and reading the notes and talking to people and whatnot. Yeah. Those audio <clears throat> tapes, by the way, was... I, I I remember the audio tapes as being something that I hadn't seen before in a game. Were, were those kind of unique? Was that Was that a Bioshock thing or a System Shock 2 thing that carried over into Bioshock? Um, I think System Shock 1 actually kind of pioneered them as a thing. Yeah. Um, and then they were adopted in a few first-person shooters. Like, um, Doom 3 actually had a lot of audio diaries. Really? Um, yeah. Not very good ones, but they were there. (laughs) Um, uh... I'm trying to think of a few other games. I think Thief had them, System Shock 2, all of those kind of um, looking glass studios sort of um, inspired games uh, used them a lot. But Bioshock did them with just so much better than any game I had ever seen before with amazing voice acting and... um, yeah, it, they they got yeah, actual actors writing. and actresses to do those voices and right. like directed them as if they were giving an actual performance, which is not really something that people did for those older audio logs as far as I know, or at least not didn't hold them to that high of a standard. 
Bioshock is really, even though there were other games previous, Bioshock is really what catapulted that into every atmospheric first person game has to have uh, has to have these audio logs. If you just played through yeah. the game and skipped those, you missed so much. I mean, so much of the game. Oh my god. I mean, there, there's yeah. parts where you had to really hack turrets and hack other things and get behind and, and unlock things to find audio, you know, audio logs. That, that, yeah. You had to get them all, you had to get all of them to get a, one of the trophies for the Platinum Trophy, so I did that. And, Jeez. uh, yeah, there was just it was amazing, and like the way that they would kind of crackle in the background a little bit, you know, because it wasn't exactly Blu-ray technology you were listening to, and how some of them would just <laughs> no. end abruptly, and or was screaming or or whatnot, and you know, it, it made it feel very legitimate and very real, not like you were just reading some, you know, somebody's. Uh, uh, video log of just how they were feeling. I mean, it actually right. gave information and and a whole lot of the backstory, a ton of the backstory. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine what Bioshock would be like if you just skipped all of those. It wouldn't be the same, in my opinion. It, it would really feel kind of like a doom, I guess. Yeah. Like a kind of a more sterile world in which you just... In- encounter tons of crazy people Mm -hmm. and a lot of times you would see things in a certain environment or a certain area and not really know a whole lot about them and then later on the the audio log would kind of make a little more sense of it like the the baby stroller that had just had the gun in it and you're like oh that's weird you know eventually there's an audio log that explains that i don't know i think it might be actually kind of an interesting experiment to go through that game and play it without the audio logs because there's so much else in that game that kind of tells the story after the fact. And what the audio logs do is is give you the backstory. But I think if you didn't listen to them, I think maybe a little bit more would be kept to your imagination. I'm not saying it would be better, but it might be an interesting way to try and play that game. Because they, it tells so much with just the visual storytelling with all the propaganda and... Yeah. and the way every area is kind of set up to be like a place that you can see where something went down, whether it was like New Year's Eve and there was some shit that went down or it was the, you know, the park, like I mentioned, or the, the hospital with the plastic surgeon oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, or the, the place with, um, uh, what's the artist? Sander name? Cohen. Sander Cohen. Um, is incredible and you wouldn't necessarily need the the um audio diaries to see that like there's a story to every area in that game which makes fills in the story of rapture itself and then the audio diaries really just complement that and complete the this mystery behind it all and and kind of tell you give you the answers as to what happened Whereas, if you didn't have those, maybe it would just stay a mystery. Maybe that wouldn't but, be but terrible. But they didn't all give you answers. A lot of them, I mean, it, it worked both ways. A lot of them left it open-ended, yeah. and then you had to use the environment to figure out the rest of the right. story. They complemented yeah, each exactly. other really well. Yeah. Did, did either of you read about this or kind of follow it prior to its release? Uh, yeah. I, I wanted to play it since it came out on X box 360 but i didn't have an xbox 360 and i'd kept hearing rumors that it was going to come out on playstation 3 so i waited and waited and waited so yeah that was a game i was very excited <laughs> and, and intrigued about and yeah. couldn't wait to play it when i when it finally did come out so um so my my question i guess is uh i remember reading about bioshock and what Bioshock eventually ended up being was a lot different than how it was talked about prior to its release. In, like, the original concept that I heard about when I first started hearing about it was um, it would almost be like uh, every time you got new powers, you got new plasmids, uh, you would be kind of corrupting your DNA more and more and becoming more like a splicer, like more like the crazy people who are you know, just crazy for Adam and 
more of these crazy genetic mutation powers. Right. Um, so it almost work like a kind of like the morality system they end up implementing with the little sisters, which I'm sure we'll talk about that more. Um, but, uh, essentially you would be to get more powerful. You would have to, uh, kind of keep going further down the rabbit hole. Um, and so it would always be that kind of a trade off. And at the end of the game, it would kind of, uh, determine your, I guess, alignment. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that still kind of was in there. Like you could choose to, to harvest the atom and use that to get other things, you know, more quickly from yeah. the little sisters. Um, and, and right. the, the the splicers and the crazy people were generally atom addicts, not plasmid addicts, and plus there were you know certain pheromones that were uh, released throughout the vent system by Andrew Ryan to to kind of enhance that because they were like his basically his his secret police. You know they were there to kind of protect him in his own way. So I and I think at the end it kind of kind of shows that if you harvest the atom for your own use. Uh, then you do go down that so-called dark morality system and things don't work out as well. If you don't, then you have a little happier ending. Looking back at this game, at the time it was revolutionary and it's incredible, but I think that there are certain parts of it that haven't aged super well. Mm -hmm. and totally. One of the one of the most prominent to me is that morality system of, oh, do you, do you harvest the little sisters, these these little children that go around to dead bodies and suck the atom out um, that are protected by the iconic big daddies. Um, y when you kill their big daddy, you have the option of harvesting them, which is you, you murder them and take the atom that they have and you get more of it. Or you can save them and take them to an orphanage um, and then they'll give you gifts. Yeah. And well, they still go out and if you save them, they'll still go out and harvest Adam for you. That's how you get your Adam, so you can use them right. in the vending machines and whatnot to buy, you know, better weapons, better ammo, more plasmids, so on and so forth. Right. It it just it it didn't seem like a morality choice. Like I don't I don't know of any because you either way you still got the Adam. Um, it just took just, longer. It just took longer, mm -hmm. and you got slightly less, I think. Mm -hmm. But if you got, like, all the little sisters, you ended up getting the same amount, I think. Yeah, um, if you, if you, like, say you even harvested one little sister, by the end of the game, if you did everything the game had to offer, you would still be able to have all the power-ups and all of that stuff. If you harvested yeah. all the little sisters, you could probably have them by the middle of the game. Right. It was just kind of like, it didn't seem like that big of a trade-off. Like, right. like, most of the people, I, I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who was like, oh yeah, I murdered all the little sisters. Like, Oh, I saw, yeah, I did. I mean, I didn't talk to anybody personally, but, <laughs> uh, yeah. You monster. <laughs> and you one are. thing I was very happy about is regarding trophies in that game is that, like, say, Infamous, for example, you had to have the you know both moralities maxed right. to be able to get the platinum trophy. So I literally had to play through that game as a terrible person, and I hated it. You know it sucked. Yeah, um, you didn't have to do that in Bioshock, so that was cool. But yeah, I, I I think any sane person, any person that just isn't doing it to be whatever, I guess ridiculous. Why would you harvest a little tiny innocent girl that just happens to have a slug in her body, like especially when the, the scientist lady, you know, pretty early on yeah. tells you, you don't need to do this. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like the, the game just doesn't provide, like, I don't, I don't think mechanically the game incentivizes you enough to tempt you towards murdering the little sisters. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just don't think the mechanically that's there. And I don't think story wise, it does a really good job p setting it up as kind of a valid choice yeah. like you can do yeah. it i guess well, why would you is kind of how the game is putting it towards you like yeah you really could murder them 
if you really wanted to, are you sure you want to? You're murdering <laughs> a kid, you monster. <laughs> it's like, but then every time you save a, a little sister, she gives you a present. So yeah, it's like <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's a silly trade off. It's there's no, there's no gameplay value really in harvesting them that I I can think of. Because no. it makes the big daddies angrier. And, and it really does. It could also make the game easier for you and unbalance it a little bit. Which yeah, which is which is fun. exactly what it does. And and that's yeah. not fun, you know. The I think one of the great things about this game is the progression of of you know getting power ups and plasmids and better oh, weapons yeah. and being able to use those in unison as you come across more difficult enemies. Uh, you know, if you just kind of get overpowered a third of the way through, then it just becomes a, you know, blast through them like you run through the game like you've played it 17 times and just, you know, you know every little detail already. So, I yeah, I don't see any reason for that morality system either, but it's there. Yeah. Um, and, like, speaking of the weapons and, like, the powers and all that stuff that you can get, how, how like... This the, Bioshock had a great variety of weapons. Like I think it was one of the first kind of actiony shooter games with a wide variety of really enjoyable weapons that I really that I really got into. Like previously to this, the only thing that even comes close in terms of your arsenal variety was probably ra- like Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, um, which we've already talked about on the show. You should go listen to our episode about it. But um, like I remember towards the end of like even towards the end of the game, you're unlocking new weapons mm-hmm. that are great. Like at the end of the, towards the end of the game, you find like this tripwire crossbow thing, yeah, and you can set up like tripwire traps that explode, uh, and then like lure enemies into these traps or big daddies get big daddies to charge into a hallway that are just filled with these and kill them and. Yeah. Like one clever yeah. move, yeah. Or the the bee power where you can shoot bees from your hand. Oh gosh, that one is so gross though. Yeah, <laughs> the I way they it. burst out of your hand. I love it, and the <laughs> the way the way they make every power kind of work. Yeah. Um, like they all are interesting. They're all fun to use and. There's always, like, some interesting application that you can use it for other than just pure offense. Like, you can... If if a turret is launching a missile at you, you can grab it with the telekinesis and launch it back. Like, it's it's amazing. And it, that was really influential mm-hmm. because you then started to see that kind of thing in... Um, Everything from Skyrim to Call of Duty, like, you know, the more recent Call of Duties have stuff like that, Advanced Warfare and whatnot. Like, it's, it was so f- interesting at the time that it was, it was like nothing that I had ever seen before in a, in a game. Like, and it, or, was, it was, like, even if it had been done before in a game, Bioshock did it so well. So well. And and one of my biggest complaints about games like Bioshock, um, prior to Bioshock, um, was that they often said that, you know, you can play the game any way you want, you know? Like, and Bioshock doesn't really do this quite, quite like, say, Deus Ex does it. Um, but, you know, there's those games that say, you know, you can play however you want to play. You, you want to play stealthy, you want to play... Um, play with all the powers. Um, games Bioshock's still do that. Like, yeah, I mean, games still do that, but but prior to Bioshock, games that did that didn't do it very well. Like one aspect was always suffering, whether it was you know a game that would give you options for stealth, but the stealth really kind of sucked. But or a game like Deus Ex, in my opinion, the the original and. Uh, sequel Invisible War that you you could play really stealthy and it was it worked really well but then when you wanted to play offensively it just didn't work very well at all 
Um, Bioshock wasn't a stealthy game at all, but it offered you variety in the way that you wanted to play, and you could... All of them were fun. Well, all of them worked. And, you know, and it was... You, you say it's not a stealthy game, and I, I agree. It, you, like, stealth isn't really a valid option in, Bio, <coughs> in Bioshock. But I think that Bioshock really rewarded, uh, you know, thinking things out. Yeah, I, w- I would say planning. more strategic than stealth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you, you could go in guns blazing, or you could, you know, take the time to figure out how you wanted to do something. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Set up your traps. Yeah. You know, hack a turret. You know, cause a distraction and get through an area without fighting that many people. Yeah. Uh, I love the hacking games, for the record, in Bioshock. A lot of people seem to think that they were silly and unnecessary. I, I really enjoyed them. Yeah, there did seem... I thought they were fun. There, there did seem to be kind of a division in, people, in like, the people who really loved Bioshock, like, towards those hacking minigames. Mm. Yeah. Me, I'm lukewarm on them. Like, I get why people didn't like them, because you had to, you had to kind of take a break from the action... Or like you, someone could be chasing you, and you could just go into this mini game that takes you like yeah. two and minutes to finish. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's kind of a weird, weird. Flow. And they weren't hurting you; they couldn't hurt you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I got to the point where I would just use the auto hack as often as possible. But I, I, I enjoyed them. See, so yeah, the I think beginning. I liked right. the puzzle part of it, especially at the beginning. They weren't overly challenging. I mean, not no. suggesting yeah. they were, yeah. but I thought it was yeah. just. And, um, you know, it was just another way to approach things. You know, hack a turret so they they shoot your enemies when you could just as easily blow up the turret and and probably get around it. Um, you know, and I think you had to hack to get into certain areas, which I love to explore, so I, I, I was well, constantly doing that. And, you know, it, it occurs to me that <clears throat> Bioshock was a console game. And a lot of the games that we've been comparing it to are PC games, like Thief, or System Shock right. 2, or, you know, these different these different games that had done similar things to Bioshock. To be clear, Bioshock was also a PC game at launch, but not, was not strictly PC. But, well, yeah, yeah. It was... It was designed more for console. I mean, it was, it was meant yeah. to be shine on the Xbox 360 for sure. And it did shine on the Xbox 360, but I think a lot of people were exposed to those kinds of games that had never played, you know, uh, Deus Ex before, or, uh, you know, and any of the... I, I know I hadn't at that point. Like, I didn't have PC games in my life until probably three or four years after Bioshock came out was when I got into PC gaming. Uh, and I know that I'm not alone with that. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think this was kind of the first exposure to realization of that promise of, oh, you can play how you want. There are different ways to play. It's not just going for sneaky headshots or going in guns blazing, you can actually plan out all these different things. I mean, you have you have options. You have an arsenal that gives you options. Sneaky headshots are almost not even an option in this type right. of game. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do is lay down the cyclone trap and watch you know the people fly and then pull out the the big. I guess it was the equivalent of a forty four. I don't know what they called it, and then just shoot them <laughs> a couple times and while they're in the air. And, mm-hmm. you know, that type of stuff or set the, you know, the traps, like all the, all the plasmids could effectively be, be set as traps. So, right. and, uh, you know, um, if you died in Bioshock, you would get taken to one of those chambers, right? And yeah. so you kind of knew the area, so you could come back and you could lay the traps out, you know, in, in a way that would help you get through the area. Cause some of those areas were pretty daunting mm-hmm. also for the record. Uh, in order to get the platinum trophy in Bioshock, you could not use one of those chambers throughout the entire game. Dang! But but all you had to do was save often, and then just if, if you die, just reload your save. And and the only difference was like when it came to Big Daddies, 
Like if you were fighting a big daddy and died and, and got taken to one of those uh, uh, revival chambers, when you got back to him, he had the same amount of life that he had. Oh, yeah. So really the only difference was you, you had to defeat him with full life every time. But I do think it was a bit of a cop-out to have enemies keep their damage when you revive. Yeah. Um, but narrative, like... I think Bioshock is one of the first games I played that actually had a narrative reason for respawning. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't just a game mechanic; yeah. there was actually a narrative yeah. reasoning behind that. And so, to that end, I guess it does make sense within the context of the game that enemies would keep their their uh, well, health after you respawn. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, one of my favorite things to do in Bioshock, by the way, was the plasmid that made Big Daddy's fight for you. Oh, the hypnotized Big Daddy yeah. one? Yeah. And that one yeah. was my absolute favorite. I would just use that and watch watch the Big Daddy go Except it would suck when, when you accidentally got near him or shot him just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Then he would certainly turn red and, like, just <laughs> boom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He did not no. like that. No. I mean, that's the thing. I can't. It's hard to think about a plasmid that I did not enjoy yeah. in that game. Although, it could just be because I don't remember the ones that weren't great. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think there was one that like created a tornado. Yeah, or the something. cyclone trap. Or was that? That's was that? That was Bioshock, Bioshock too. But the the cyclone okay. trap and and the first one would put this little like whirl whirlpool thing on the floor, and when somebody stepped right. on it, it would spring them up in the air, and they just you know this crazy animation and. Um, and it gave you enough time to... And that was the other thing about Bioshock. That See, even the one I thought sucked doesn't suck. The, 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 <laughs> the, 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 one of the other great things about Bioshock is the UI. You could switch between plasmids and and uh, weapons pretty quickly to where you could actually yep. throw somebody up in the air and then hit them with incinerate by the time they came down, which is switching plasmids. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think that it just the the... The variety of gameplay options that it, that it left the player was pretty unique, and there were certain areas where, you know, the electricity, like in the water areas, where you could just fry a bunch of people in in a puddle of water, uh, worked great. And when you were in that icy area in like Fontaine Fisheries or whatever it's called, the the incendiary one was was mo- most ideal. You know, so they all had their their place. And you could use them in unison, unison, unisom, whatever that word is, unison. I think unisom <laughs> is a sleeping pill, but probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I played that game so much that I kind of just learned how to, you know, what was most effective with each individual enemy. I think, and I enjoyed learning that. Yeah, I mean, we we haven't even talked about the actual story of Bioshock yet. Well, um, we yeah. we kind of just dove in and started talking about things that we loved about it, but uh, I think the story is actually one of the strongest parts. Like, it's one of the all time greatest gaming twists, right? Oh yeah. Um, the would the would you kindly? I was just going to say, Jack, would you kindly delve into the story for us? <laughs> well, I mean, the the basic story is you're a guy in an airplane and all of a sudden it explodes in the middle of the ocean. You go down with the plane. Uh, you kind of get to the surface. You see that there's a there's a tower. You go over to the tower and inside you find like this ocean elevator and you get in because what else are you going to do in the middle of the ocean? Uh, and it takes you down to the ocean floor where there's an entire city. And that city's called Rapture. And this, and that happens in the year 1960. Right. Yep. And so everything down there is set within kind of the, the 50s and 60s era. And the the entire city is founded on the... Ba- basically, the entire city is this embodiment of you know the ideals of Anne Rand. Yeah. Um, Which, Andrew it, Ryan, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to not see the similarities there. Yeah, I mean, like, Andrew Ryan is is supposed to be Andrew. Yeah, essentially. Um, and if you don't know who Anne Rand is, basically it's you, 
you're entitled to all of the basically put yourself before everyone else and screw everyone else. Do you do you? Well, it's not um, so much screw everyone else, but only help others if you choose to or want to, and there's no moral obligation to do so. I, I right. guess. And and there's no there's no moral obligation to put others before yourself. Correct. It's it's everybody gets the fruits of their own labor and if they can't fruit to their own labor then oh well. Yep. Tough love for yeah. them. Um and so to that end, because in the upper world Andrew Ryan found himself confined by society's standards, you know, the religion or communism or even the bonds of like living underneath the rule of a government. Mm-hmm. So he founded this underwater city because he's a billionaire and can build an underwater city. And he invited the greatest minds and athletes and artists from around the world to come live in his city um, where they could do whatever they wanted unrestricted. And scientists, which is important. Because... Right, right. Right. And at the bottom of the ocean, they eventually discover that there's like the sea slug and it has genetic manipulation properties. Um, and they started using it to create all kinds of different effects. Um, and that basically led to the implosion of their society. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of um, touches on both ends. Like, like they initially they made great advances. They made great advances in science and it was this, this dystopia, this utopia, but then it fell apart real fast when, when, you know, one or two people decided to to start doing things differently or for nefarious reasons. And there was nothing there to keep them in check. And it just went right. that, like within two years. It was. Well, so, so what happened was, uh, basically these smugglers these from the outside found rapture mm-hmm. and came down there and lived down there, I guess. Um, and they were headed by a man named Fontaine and, Eventually, Fontaine grew to have so much influence in Rapture that he was able to challenge Andrew Ryan, and the two kind of began a war in the city. And that war included, of course, all these powers from genetic manipulation. Uh, and so everything is, by the time you your character gets down there, is kind of in ruins. People are killing each other. People have killed each other a lot. Um and Fontaine posing as a man named Atlas contacts you over the radio and starts kind of manipulating you into helping him unbeknownst to you for a great majority of the game. Yeah. He, he help he helps you to, he thinks you're, he makes you think you're helping to help these people and to, uh, you know, save his family. Like his right. his family is being held prisoner or something by splicers and blah 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 blah, and he really wants you to help them, and then he's going to help you. And really, it's just a giant ploy to kill Andrew Ryan. Correct. Right. Um, and really, to me, like the the point at which you kill Andrew Ryan is the point at which you discover that you are basically a clone of Andrew Ryan mm-hmm. that has been instilled with kind of uh, mental manipulation. And so anytime the keyword would you kindly is said, your character is in- compelled to do the command right. that follows. So, yeah. And yeah. So, so you learned the like, I mean, you learned that, that Andrew Ryan kind of turns off a lot of the gadgets and technology, including the bathospheres it, to where only he could actually use them with his DNA. So that's why Jack, yeah. the the main character, is able to to use those, but the players don't know that, and Jack doesn't know that until it's revealed much later on in the game. Um, and he essentially has to, you know, he, yeah, he has to to follow Fontaine slash Atlas's orders because that's also programmed into him. And yep. you know, you learn that he actually is the one that crashes the plane. He has no qualms killing. Andrew Ryan and Andrew Ryan just sits there and takes it, you know, 
a, 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 a man chooses, a slave obeys, so stick this golf club through my neck, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, and he uses that moment so amazing because he he uses it as like a way to make his yeah. point, but at the same time he knows he's going yeah. to be killed making yeah. his point. And so he's he, this is how he's choosing to leave. This is how he's choosing yeah. to die. Yeah. yeah. And it is a brutal scene. You as the yeah. player are forced to beat a man to like in all the other scenes throughout the game, it's really actually really unique and powerful that he doesn't fight you. Like it's not a boss yeah. fight to kill Andrew Ryan. Right. This is the first man you've encountered in the game who isn't trying to kill you and you are forced to become essentially that the first splicer you meet in the game that's just trying to murder mm-hmm. you and insanely like can't control herself trying to kill you um this th- that's what you become in that scene you are compelled to beat him to death with a golf club yeah. uh and i think to me that's where the game story peaks uh and I would yeah. have actually been kind of okay if the game had ended at that point. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of the boss fight at the end. Yeah, because... No, I don't think anybody was. Everything after that leads up to a generic video game boss fight against Fontaine, who has basically roided himself yeah. up with all the powers and plasmids in the city and is going to It kill takes you. like seven final forms. It becomes like a Final Fantasy game at that point. Yeah, like he basically becomes the giant golden idol god yeah. Yeah. figure. Atlas, yeah, the the statue that's that greets you at the yeah. beginning. But also, uh, really, the statue that's outside the, um, the real um, tower in New York, um, Rockefeller Plaza. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean it looks yeah. just like it. The image, the imagery in the fight is really is really neat. The imagery throughout the entire game is really neat. It's just the game is so revolutionary in so many ways, and then it falls back on this yeah. this generic oh fight the super powered bad guy. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and it like I can't hold it against it. Like that's the convention of two thousand seven. Like that's where games were at the time, but. Um, you know, and, and it couldn't. It couldn't have the ending The Last of Us had in 2013, right? You know, no. even though that probably would have served the, that kind of a downer ending, probably would have served the game's overall message a lot better. I mean, I have to wonder if that ending was kind of like was due to s- focus testing, because I've heard like The Last of Us, the ending didn't test well with focus testers and with focus groups. And I, I, the ending to Bioshock just smacks of like watered down focus tested ending. It it does. It does seem like something that the creators of the game might not have necessarily wanted to have in their game. To be fair, the boss fight is not the end. I mean, there is that whole, montage of stuff right. that goes through after that depending on your morality yeah. level. And there is but that it, kind it, of... Yeah. It's like your... It, it's like the last... It's like, the last part of gameplay. Part of yeah, game. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, not to mention, before you get to the Fontaine boss fight, there's another terrible part of that game, which is a part of the game that you would think would be awesome, because on paper it sounds amazing, and it, it but it doesn't play well. It's the part where you become a big daddy. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to find all the parts so that you can become a yeah. big daddy. And it's just awful. Yeah. Like, in execution, <laughs> it's just terrible. Like, you're walking around really slow. And that's part of, like, it, when it Bioshock is fun drilling 2 people, came though. out. Yeah. I mean, that. yeah, that was fine. That was fun. But it wasn't Bioshock, yeah. you know? It was yeah. not what I had been doing the entire game, which was so much yeah. fun. Um, that's why when Bioshock 2 came out, I was like, you know, at first, I was very weary of that game. I did not think I was going to like it at all, and I disliked it for different reasons, but the playing as the Big Daddy was not a problem in Bioshock 2, so they, 2K and Marin did a good job with that, but man, playing as a Big Daddy in, in the first one was just a 
bummer. Well, and, and so then, then after the that final boss fight, like you were saying, Jeremy, there are kind of the the two the two different reactions to how you treated the little sisters throughout the game. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and Jeremy, maybe you can tell us about those. Well, essentially, if you didn't harvest any of the little sisters or harvested only one, you got this ending where you made it to the surface with five of the little sisters and it kind of shows them going on living somewhat normal, happy, healthy lives, you know, in the United States on the mainland. If you... Um, and this one I just barely recall because I watched a YouTube video of it a long time ago. If you didn't do that, then basically the little sisters go through pure hell and so do you for the rest of your lives. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> and there's right. a baseball somewhere along the line. Or wait, is that Bioshock okay. 2? I think that's 2. <laughs> See, it all runs together. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, it, it, the good ending shows them growing up, getting married, and, you know, you're there to to basically walk them down the aisle and be a part of their lives, and they have kids and whatnot. Uh, the bad ending is they end up, I guess, hooked on heroin and, and street drugs. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like, it's just another example, I think, of... I think they had grand intentions for that morality system that just had to be trimmed for lack of time to actually implement those. Sure. You know? In in terms of where their priorities were when making the yeah. game and how much of a budget they had and all that stuff. I, I, the atmosphere to this game... Is something that I'll, I will always remember and something that always brings me back to it. And I know it hasn't aged well, but for the time, the lighting, the sound, just oh, the I, different areas. I think that stuff is still That great. part still has aged well? Uh, yeah, I think so, um, too. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. going from the the rundown parts of, of Rapture, which I guess they were all kind of run down, but then finding <laughs> finding that beautiful garden in the middle that's still being you know taken care of as well as possible. Um, is is awesome, and then just exploring the apartments, seeing how, you know, how well they really were built at first, and then how fast they they became ran down, and the music and the the eeriness that would come. Like sometimes you would get that eerie music and and the weird lighting effects, and nothing would happen, mm-hmm. but you'd be on guard. And then other times you you would just you know not have those, <laughs> and then you'd have splicers bouncing off the walls all around you. And you're like, oh, yeah, the game man. really messed yeah. with you. It, but in like in, in like a good, good way, way. Yeah. like it, you had to be on yeah. guard. You had to keep on your yeah. toes. And like we we also haven't even touched on in the the numerous memorable encounters you have throughout your time in Rapture, like meeting meeting Sander Cohen. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's a reason he came back in the DLC for. Bioshock Infinite, and it's because everyone remembers Sander. Yeah, he's Cohen. an iconic character, Be- right? I, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, he he's creepy as heck. Like he's the one. Like even though, yeah, the Splicers are wearing all of these masks, he's the one that makes you remember that the Splicers wore yeah. the masks. And the show must go on. I mean, like he's he's dedicated to what his his duty was or what his his goal was when he got there. Well, I think I think with Sander, it was more like not necessarily perfect art. It was just the freedom to. I'm sorry, I just really liked that character. It was more like just the freedom to. To him, perfect art is anything yeah. you want it to be, right. and he wanted the freedom to be able to do anything he wanted in the name yeah. of art, including murdering <laughs> people and using their bodies in horrific yes. ways for art. Right, and yeah. his artistic installations were. They were artistic. I'll, I'll give him that. His area really is absolutely the yeah, best yeah, in that. The whole the the, the theater and then the the grand ballroom, all of that. His yeah. entrance. Yeah, with all those slot <laughs> I mean, machines. <laughs> I played those I mean, for hours. It, yeah, I mean, talking about atmosphere, his like his entire section is perfect. Um, yeah, and. I would I would also argue that the plastic surgeon I I can't remember his name off the top of my head but I'll yeah like 
that entire sequence is very memorable to me. It's gruesome. Like him. Yep. Like when you first read about that, like because because there's some notes you find in that area, and then a couple audio diaries, and you're like, what? What? How can, and 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 oh, women yeah. volunteering for it, and you're like, whoa, right. wow, crazy, and yes, his madness and just like wanting to find or sculpt, literally sculpt the perfect person. And it just got more grotesque and more grotesque each time. Well, I, I think, I think his arc was that he was making people look perfect, but then he took it too far. He, well, he didn't, he, it's not that he took it too far. I think, I think his, his perception of what is perfect changed and kind of like how people mastered realistic painting and then moved on to impressionism and like cubism and like stuff like that um, in terms of like painting. I think that's what he was doing, but with plastic surgery, his name was Steinman, by the way, Steinman, which is really, it's a really interesting like idea as like a plastic surgery thing and really horrifying. Yeah. Now I'm not, not really interesting as in that should be done. But just like I, putting those two ideas together is really, uh, it takes a lot of creativity on the terms, on the, on the part of the creative team for Bioshock. I want to talk about like how creative this game is. And what I love about it is that it came at a time where creativity was something that was suddenly proving to be like a sales driver. Like all of a sudden, Independent games were starting to come out. Um, yeah, this was like they, right on the cusp of when yeah, indie games were Yeah, it was, it was right before thing. indie games really took off. But, you know, people were craving unique experiences, and, and and this really gave it to people. And it proved that there was more that video games could do there were more settings that video games could use than just you know the typical fantasy or real world military or cop dramas or whatever or sci-fi um it was like let's let's take a game like system shock where the setting is really part of the story and unique and interesting and make it a blockbuster and it worked and it was a blockbuster and it proved that that could work. And I think that had a huge influence on the industry. And one of the things that I loved the most about Bioshock when it first came out was that like I could talk about it and and not feel like a complete nerd and (laughs) not feel like I was, I was just talking about like a Lord of the Rings ripoff or, or whatever, you know, like this was something completely unique. This was something that Hollywood had never shown me before that like a lot of because i mean well it was about a lot of video games it's a a lot of video games rip rip off hollywood and bioshock did not do that like not only did it not do that but it's it's a game that is about ideas it's not yeah it's not settling for just portraying something it's not settling for just being cinematic because for the longest time being cinematic was like Oh, oh my gosh, the highest praise for games. Like, oh my right. gosh, it has cutscenes and there's voice acting? That's incredible. Right. Uh, and that was a very low bar that a lot of people had. And I think Bioshock kind of bucked that. And yep. was, like, I think it's one of the first games, like, you... <sighs> I don't, I don't want to say it's one of the first games, but during now we live in a time where there are lots of games that are about ideas and there are lots of games that, you know, you can dissect and find you know, <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of meaning in. This was Bioshock came out when games were still considered just games. And I say that with air quotes. Um, it came out in a time when games were just supposed to be fun and they're not art. They're not art yet. Uh, like this was the time when you know you got Roger Ebert saying games are playthings. They're not art. 
Right. You got you got people uh, that debate was raging across the internet at the time. I remember, um, and this is one of the games that people were like, "See, games are about things. Like you can you can have deep, meaningful messages in your games. You can they can convey things that are important." Um, yeah. I think even more than that, like, uh, it was a mature game that felt like it was for adults. Like, it it just, it felt like you, to really get the most out of it, you had to think, you know? Like, it was was a game that made you think, but at the same time, it was just really fun to play. And, like, it didn't have to be mindless, dumb action to be really fun to play um it, it could do yeah, both and it did right. both well it had very mature themes and and ideals yeah. and and areas that made you really think but at the same time it was just a blast to play and and it and you could do yeah. both you didn't have to stop doing one to focus on the other or appreciate the other the game kind of flowed in a way that that allowed you to do that because leading up to lots of areas there were you know there were times when when you would go a good five ten minutes without any real major combat, uh, you would get scared a couple times, but you know you could really just kind of uh, think think back on what you saw or what's coming next. And this is just me personally, right? And but then when it was time to to engage in in the gameplay, which is you know mostly guns and weird magic powers, it it didn't take away from that. It didn't lose a beat. You did that and you moved on. And, um, yeah, I think it's important that you, it's not, impo- it's not necessary, but I think the more you explored in this game and the more areas that you opened up and the more that you actually researched, um, or, or read the research and, and re- listened to the audio files and read the notes and, and just even the little writings on the wall here and there, I think the more you got out of it and it has a very deep meaning and that meaning can mean lots of different things to different people, but it's still just so damn fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think we're getting to the point where we should kind of move to wrap yeah, up. I would completely agree with that. Would you kindly Jeremy tell me if you think that this is one of the best games period? I absolutely think this is one of the best games period and it's probably in my top 5 favorite games of all time hands down. Probably even 3. Okay. What about you, Daniel? It's no Half-Life, but it's definitely one of the best games period. Yeah. I I actually, I would agree with Jeremy. It's probably in my top ten of all time. Okay. Um, I just, there's, I can't say enough good things. I could go on for, like, hours just talking about how great this game (laughs) is. Yeah, I mean, I I was sitting here thinking, man, we've been talking about this for a long time. I look over at the clock. Yeah. We've been talking for over an hour about Bioshock, and we were all just completely exhausted going into this. I have an aquarium, Uh, like. Probably 18 feet from me that's filled with Bioshock stuff. I'm, I set it up to look like Rapture. <laughs> no joke. Oh, that's no awesome. Joke. Yeah. Like, it's, it's really not cool. to scale because, like, the, the Eve hypo needle is that big one and, and, and the <laughs> plasma bottles are kind of the big ones and the little sister is tiny, tiny and the big daddies are, are big and just the other characters are about the size of the little sisters, but it's all there and it's pretty neat. I, I, I have an art print framed right behind me in my living room. I've seen that that art print. Yeah, you've seen that. Uh, That's the cover to the book, the the Bioshock book. Um, Minus, it's just the art, the concept art, the book, the cover that was on the cover. Um, And it's before the fall. It's like the it's the uh, ballroom in. That's a cool print. that, that's the thing uh, that I don't know that we touched on, but the artwork in Bioshock was amazing. It it was it's iconic. The the little sisters and big daddies, specifically the big daddies, and and just the the Art Deco architecture of the city 
It was all really well done. Well, and the whole retro aesthetic hadn't been kind of mined to death by right. uh, Fallout. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> now that's yeah. a whole new story. but Yeah, now it's a little bit more tired, but there's a reason like that kind of got kicked yeah. off, and that was a lot to do with uh, Bioshock. Yeah. And I, I think for me, I wouldn't put it in... I, I think it slipped over time. I, I, when it came out, I definitely would have put it in my top three. I think it might not even be in my top 10 anymore. Um, but it's definitely in like my top 20. Uh, but I like, it's definitely one of the best games period. I mean, like just hands down, we all, we all looked at kind of our list of games that we kind of go through to decide what we're going to do next. And when we chose Bioshock, it was just kind of like, well, this is, this is a, this is a shoe in. I we're all going to agree on this yeah, one. Yeah, that's probably. kind of a no brainer. I think. How crazy would it be if we all did like a one eighty <laughs> on Bioshock, and when the week after we all unanimously vote in, <laughs> gone home, we all unanimously vote I would, on Bioshock. I, I, uh, would be, people I'd would be, be checking mad. myself into a mental ward if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like I think for me, one of the biggest things, and you touched on this a little bit, Daniel. Uh, when you talked about how it's one of the first games that kind of didn't do traditional fantasy and it didn't do realism. It kind of did its own thing. And to me, like I've always wondered looking at a lot of games that are made, why you stick with the real world when you can literally do anything you could possibly imagine in a game, right? Like anything. And to me, the Bioshock series particularly Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite are great examples of what you can do when you just let your imagination go in games. Like you can bring an underwater city to life. You can bring a city to life that's flying in the sky through the clouds and it's gorgeous and wonderful and exciting and like every second of it kind of thrills with the power of imagination. And I love that. I love that a lot. And so, I mean, it, it, it's like, like I said, it's a no brainer that this is one of the best games period. I don't think I, I think you would be hard pressed. I'm sure there are people out there, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find people who would disagree with that assessment. Uh, yep. I agree with that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, I don't, I can't say any more about that game. It's just great. All right. So that was episode 31 of the best games period. Jack, Jeremy, thank you both for joining me tonight on this rapturous journey. You're welcome. If you, if you like the show, Please let us know. We are on Twitter at Best Games Period. You can also leave a review on iTunes where you can find the show every Monday when it posts, as well as on SoundCloud, Extra Life, and Game Informer. Jack, tell the fine folks all about Extra Life. Do you like playing games? I kind of assume that you would if you're listening to this podcast. If you don't like games, what are you doing here? Get out! Get out! Just leave. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, you casuals. Or or maybe rethink your position and listen to us every week. Uh, either way, basically, if you like games and you like kids, uh, you can combine those two interests. And huh? basically, you know how people do like walkathons or run marathons for oh. charity? Well, Extra Life is basically that, except with games. So you can play games for 24 hours and raise money to help kids who are in your local Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Um, It goes to pay for treatment for kids who might not otherwise be able to pay for it. 100% of everything you raise goes directly to the hospital of your choice. So not only do you get to feel good about helping kids... But you know exactly where that money is going and that all of the money that you raised is going to help those kids. Um, And you also get to play games. So, I mean, like, there's no downside to it. You were probably going to play games anyway, right? Why not play games and help kids at the same time? 
Um, and Why not, indeed? You can find Extra Life at community.extra-life.org or just extra-life.org if you don't want that whole community part of it. Ugh. Uh, and uh, check it out. See, see if maybe it's right for you. It probably is if you're listening this much into our podcast. Um, so, yeah. Would you kindly donate to Extra Life? <laughs> Would you kindly? See, yeah, everybody's going to have to. All right, so that was episode 31 of the Best Games Period. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, I'm Daniel Jones with Jack Gardner and Jeremy Brown. See y'all later on the flip. Buddy dip buddy. See on the surface. Oh, that was a good one.